Uh, tonight, I'd like to begin where we stopped last, last week. Uh, there are two uh, biblical writers that have garnered the ire and really the hatred of the evolution community. Uh, it's John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. Um, in uh, Henry Morris's, one of his books, uh, he identified 14 unique characteristics of the book of Genesis where it shows the origins or beginning of something of great scientific importance. Uh, and uh, that's what we'll look at tonight. Uh, we began... Well, this evening, we're continuing, and really we're just still introducing um, uh, in, our, in our study of the Bible and science. Something that uh, I believe is pretty much true. Um, we probably know about science more than we know technically the Bible. Uh, and so we're going to introduce a lot of things where the Bible is concerned, help us learn that, before we get into the actual questions, the answers. Uh, tonight, I'd like to begin where we stopped last, last week. Um, there are two uh, biblical writers that have garnered the ire and really the hatred of the evolution community. Uh, it's John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. Um, in uh, Henry Morris's, one of his books, uh, he identified 14 unique characteristics of the book of Genesis where it shows the origins or beginning of something of great scientific importance. Uh, and uh, that's what we'll look at tonight. All righty. Uh, the Bible is a book of beginnings. That's what Genesis means. And it shouldn't surprise us uh, that it does show the beginnings of a lot of things. I frankly, uh, as I was preparing for this, was a little surprised how many origins Genesis gives us. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be looking at the next uh, number of minutes. Uh, the first one, obviously, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible gives us in Genesis the origin of the universe, okay? Only Genesis. Science cannot do this. Other philosophies and religion have not tried. Only Genesis addresses the change from nothing to something. Everything else begins with something and then builds on that. Uh, the very words of Genesis 1-1 show that God began with nothing and created. Uh, and so it, show, it gives us the origin of the universe. Uh, it gives an eyewitness account of how space, matter, and time of the universe came into being. This is especially significant when we understand uh, that every other system, every other creation model begins with something and shows how it developed. Uh, the, uh, the great challenge today is to try to prove that the universe is eternal. Uh, that's the only way evolutionists can get, away, get, get around this or get away from it. If the universe had no beginning, it needs no creator, right? The problem is, it is scientifically provable the universe had a beginning. And uh, frankly, it's very easy uh, they are they're self-destructing in this area, really, if you, if you, if you listen carefully. Uh, biological evolution says the, the universe has got to be at least, what, about six and a half or seven and a half billion years old. If you take something like our sun, we know the rate at which it is decaying um, uh, in its radiation. You can't back that up seven and a half billion years. You can't do it. We know that our uh, orbits are all decaying. You can't back them up seven and a half billion years. You see, biological evolution, every time it comes to a roadblock, something you cannot explain, uh, it adds a lot of time, millions or billions of years, because they're hoping we believe that given enough time, anything is possible. Now, you've heard this before, you'll hear a lot. It doesn't matter how much time you give it, the impossible is always the impossible. And we've got to understand that, okay? Um, I cannot jump over this building. I don't really care how much time you give me to practice. It's not going to happen. If I were to go out and try tonight, I can promise you 
I wouldn't really be a spot on that wall very much above ground. <laughs> okay, it's impossible. There are a lot of things that are impossible. Uh, and we need to understand, you cannot say, well, give enough time. Uh, you, you just, you can't. When we, if, if we get into where we're really discussing um, scientific biology uh, and the origin of species and all that, uh, one of the reasons that it's mathematically impossible is something called repeatability. Um, the idea is that uh, you, know, you have a certain number of genes in your genetic makeup and your, uh, your DNA is just, and given enough time, it'll all kind of fall into place. The moment you enter into that argument, the possibility that some things happen more than once, you're sunk. Math, it, 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 there's so many things going on. So here, the origin, the, excuse me, the universe had to have a beginning. It had to. And the only religion that even addresses something from nothing is Genesis. I think that's pretty amazing. Secondly, it does talk about the origin of the ardor and complexity of the universe. Okay? Uh, what I, I, I enjoy science. I really do. Uh, and years and years ago, I, I got my first little telescope, and I enjoy looking at the stars. And I may have shared some of y'all, back when uh, Saturn was fairly close to the Earth, and you could actually see it, uh, I got my little telescope out, uh, and uh, I, it seems that Kristen was still home. Lori, I'm not really sure. I and one of, my daughter or granddaughter, I'm not sure which, we went in the front yard, and we actually saw the rings of Saturn. It was really neat. Uh, and you start looking at the order of the universe in a telescopic view, and it becomes very clear it is superhuman. How in the world can something that big and it doesn't blow up or run, run into each other? We've got a solar system. Depending on who you talk to, Pluto may or may not be a planet, whatever, but they're circling around. You know, most of the orbits are in the same plane. Now try to do that by accident. Uh, they, they, they don't run into each other. Some of them have, what, 11 or 12, 13 moons. They circle. They don't fall. And when you start trying to figure out what are the chances of all of this happening by accident, and the answer is no chance at all. But wait a minute. The Bible actually deals with the origin of the universe, doesn't it? It talks about how God set or created the sun, the moon, and he put the stars in place. Um, the complexity is scientifically, mathematically impossible, but uh, the Bible deals with that. The order of the seasons, the planets, the creation as a whole, how we all interrelate. All of that could not possibly have happened by accident. You know, again, I, I, forgive me for little rabbit trails, but the uh, flowers that, that developed by accident. You know, you have the pistil and stamen, you've got the, the, uh, the, the petals and all that, the, the, the stem and the, the, the leaves and the roots and all that working. Boy, what a great accident. But then you've got to have insects that pollinate them. What a great accident that we had the, the flowers grow, and before they could die, we had a bee evolve. Because that plant could not survive without the bee. What an incredible act of accident. Does that sound stupid? And I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't use the word. It is foolish. You see, what often happens is they try to get us to focus on one system, and they usually want us to focus on a simple system, and forget there are so many systems that are interrelated. And if they evolved, they had to evolve at the same time. You know, I've shared before, uh, as complex as, as we are, uh, and uh, to think that, boy, they teach that from basically nothing to where we are uh, happened by accident, just uh, a random gathering together of, of uh, proteins and, and uh, all kinds of nucleic acids and all that, and here we are. And they ignore the fact that it had to happen twice at the same time with differences, one a male and one a female. You have just increased the improbability astronomically to the point of impossibility. The Bible explains the origin of all those systems. 
whether it be um, the systems of the universe, the systems of uh, the stuff of creation. He gives us a model where origins are concerned that begins with either, in fact, the Bible begins with eternal God. The world says we have to be in either that or eternal universe. Shared that before. Man's observa actual observations, that's science, remember, if it's, it's got to be measured and observed, is that order never comes from disorder. There is no observation ever where you've got an, a, a tremendous mess and all of a sudden order came out of it. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I like boiled eggs. I've never seen a boiled egg come from a scrambled egg. Scrambled eggs disorder, boiled egg is order. Not going to happen. There is no, absolutely there is no evidence of ever order coming from disorder. Evolution demands it. There is also no evidence of, the, uh, of, se of what is simple producing something that is more complex. And every one of us, if you went through the public school system, you always taught that there was, uh, back billions of years ago in some prim primordial swamp, there was a protein there that probably got hit by lightning, and all of a sudden it became life. And for that very simple organism, we have something as complex as humankind. There is no observable evidence, zero, of that ever actually happening. None. So when somebody talks about, well, you know, the, the, the simple produce something more complex and more complex, and, and the universe is becoming more and more complex, you know right there they have exited science, and now they're in philosophy or religion. And their religion, philosophy, has no evidence where we stand has the bulk of the evidence. And Genesis talks about the origin of the order and of the complexity of the universe. Okay? Only in the Bible where we have that and that person is identified as God. Within that, we have the origin of our solar system. Clearly teaches sun, moon, other planets, and stars were created by the God of the Bible. Do you realize that every naturalistic attempt to explain the solar system has failed? That's why you keep getting new ones. It doesn't work. The origin of the atmosphere and water, or liquid water. One of the interesting things about uh, astronomy is that as far as we've reached out, we have not found one other planet that has liquid water. They say, well, we have evidence because we have the elements. Fine, put them together. It's not there. No other planet. It is unique because, it has it, because of the existence of very large amounts of water in large bodies. The chemical composition of our atmosphere. Okay? We have oxygen, but we also have carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Without all three of those, you and I would die. We would. Just the perfect balance evolved by accident, just the perfect balance of needing that evolved by accident, or we have a creator God that did it. Again, I wish we had the time. And at some point, we're going to go and look at some of the scientific evidence. But the reality is the proposition that all this came about by random accident has no evidence. And what is actually observable tremendously supports the Bible. And again, I want to remind you, most of the scientific theories that, uh, that we can accept today as fact, man discovered them thousands of years after the Bible was written. So you can't say, well, the Bible was written based on scientific evidence. The Bible was written beyond scientific evidence. It came up, there was only one source. You go back 1,440 years before Christ, where do you get that the life of the body is in the blood? That's something they discovered, I think, in the 1600s. A.D., not B.C. The Bible is incredibly scientifically accurate. The fact that, that uh, we revolve around the sun... Do you realize that that's supported in the Old Testament? And yet, it was thousand, over a thousand years later where science discovered that. Uh, I understand, although I wasn't there. Bob, you could help us out here. Um, when Columbus came over, 
a lot of folks thought he was going to fall off the edge of the earth because it was flat. The Bible shows the earth to be round. 1440 B.C. Our atmosphere, our water, uh, the interrelated systems between uh, the, the environment we have, the uh, elements of our uh, uh, grasses and trees and then animal life, they all are so interdependent and we have an atmosphere and water that will support them all. The earth is unique, by the way, in those. If we go from just the general order and complexity to the origin of life, life from non-life for a humanist, for a naturalist, is a mystery that will be impossible to answer. You can't do it. The complexity itself shows it's impossible. One writer said this, each individual DNA carries an almost infinite number of variations. When combined with the way each such animals interrelate and the complexity of their environment, what is actually observed is mathematically impossible without a creator. Materialism or atheism cannot come close to explaining it. Only special creation. A creator is required. And it's only in the creation account of Genesis chapter 1 where we have a scientifically accurate explanation. Again, as we get to those verses when we study Genesis 1, we're going to see even the order of the days are scientifically accurate. One is built on the other. These were not just random where some writer said, well, on day one we'll put the creation of the stars, on, on day two human beings... Um, day three, we're going to get the rest of the universe. Day four, we're going to get animals. Day five, plant. No. The order in which they were recorded in Genesis is a scientifically necessary order for us to have the universe we have. Can't explain that on a human level. It's impossible. The origin of man. The origin of man. Man, as far as we have discovered so far, is a single most complex element in the universe. When one considers how complex we are physically, how many interrelated systems we have, and think of it. Uh, now, I, my anatomy and physics are going to go back too many years to get them all right, but we have got a circulatory system, and we have got a digestive system. We have got, what's the heart system called? cardiovascular system. We've got a lymphatic system. Uh, by the way, what is the largest, um, uh, largest organ in your body? Skin. Your skin. You knew that. Good. Your skin. And how many of those systems relate to that? And so not only did all of those have to evolve, they had to evolve to work together, and they don't work without each other. Man is incredibly complex as far as our biology or anatomy goes. And its random origin is clearly impossible. But that's not all there is. We've got to add to this the fact that man is also dependent on the environment where we're living. And we have got to be a match or a fit for that. And then personally, the capstone of all of this is that man is also spiritual we have a capacity to imagine, to originate or to conceive, to believe, to consider all the abstracts like love and beauty and God and hate and all of this stuff. And none of these could possibly have evolved from any other animal. Why? They don't have it. There is no evidence that any animal has these intangible abilities to imagine, to originate, to conceive, to consider abstracts. It is undeniable that man has it. Where did it come from? Oh, God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. That's that intangible. Where did it come from? Didn't evolve. Came from God. It is impossible. Evolutionary sci science has no capability to even address that let alone explain it.
but Genesis does. It is absolutely important. If the rest of the Bible is the house of our faith, Genesis is the foundation. And if Genesis is the foundation, the elements from which it is built is chapters 1 through 11. Creation to the flood. You cannot explain man in his diversity, both physical, ecological, and spiritually, any other place from the Bible. Genesis, the book of beginnings. Genesis also, Genesis also gives us the origin of marriage. There is nothing in human nature, culture, or history that can explain the existence of marriage. While it is nearly a universal concept, there is no human source for it. Where did it come from? I don't know. Anthropology can identify that it exists and always has. But where did it come from? Animals don't marry. Now hold off. You say, well, some mate for life. That's a whole lot different than establishing a marriage relationship. Trust me. Shared responsibilities. Um, all of the stuff involved in human marriage. You don't find it anywhere else. It is unique. Henry Morris in the Genesis record made this comment. The remarkably universal and stable institution of marriage and the home in a monogamous, patriarchal social culture is likewise described in Genesis as having been ordained by the Creator. Polygamy, infanticide, matriarchy, promiscuity, divorce, abortion, homosexuality, and all other corruptions developed later. You know what the first relationship that God had that the world ever saw was marriage. All this stuff developed after that. I think that's, that is, to me, significant. Marriage did not grow out of the chaos that we figured we've got to have something to make our culture or our societies work, so we're going to take all this mess, create marriage. Marriage was first. And everything else is as we have uh, just messed it up and tried to destroy it in our sin nature. Only Genesis deals with the origin of marriage. One of the most difficult to address issues as a Christian is the existence of sin. People just, you know, how can a loving God let this happen? Or how did this happen? Or how could God, you know, let Satan, you know, all kinds of questions. Are they hard to answer? Yeah, they are. But guess what? Only the Bible deals with the origin of sin. Only one. Uh, I was sharing with Sylvester a week or so ago when I was doing um, uh, karate. The sensei was very much into the Eastern religions. It wasn't just karate. It was getting into, um, well, the yin and the yang was part of it, but I'm not talking about the symbol. I'm talking about the religion behind it. Uh, and they tried to uh, explain how you have this eternal conflict between the good and the bad. Uh, and... Um, that, that any time you started pressing, well, where did evil come from? Well, we don't know, but it's always been eternal. Um, the pantheists, those who believe that God is in everything, they cannot explain the origin or the, even the existence of evil. Because God is in everything, and you've got good and evil, that means God opposes himself. And that doesn't make any sense. Only the Bible addresses the origin of evil. It is easy to address goodness, easy to explain the concept an existence of goodness is universal, but try to explain the existence of evil. The concepts of goodness, truth, love, beauty, morality, and honesty, and all others are consistent with the character of God of the Bible, and also consistent with what the evolution would say this is the best uh, development of mankind. But humanistic science or sociology are inadequate to explain the origin of the opposite, such as murder, thievery, selfishness, etc. Only the Bible gives a satisfying description of the origin of evil. By the way, the Bible calls it sin. Don't be afraid of that word. It is socially unacceptable, but it always has been. But sin is real. The Bible also shows sin to be temporary. Amen to that? Was sin there from the beginning? No, thank you. 
It was intru- it intruded, it was introduced after God looked at everything that he had made and said, it is very good. Will sin be here forever? No. Nope. There will come a day when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The sin will be a distant memory, if a memory at all. All creation will be returned to its pre-sin condition. I believe that all creation will at that moment become exactly and perfectly what God had created it to become originally. Satan will not have one, one instant of victory. Sin is temporary. The Bible shows its origin and shows its end. Amen. We don't have to worry about how to deal with it forever. How do we deal with our sin? The first thing we do is realize that we have a Savior, right? Sin intruded into God's perfect creation, but it's not God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the price, judicially paid the price demanded by your sin and mine. Where a holy God can stay holy and still say, I forgive you. The price is gone. Jesus Christ literally paid it all. God, the moment we receive Christ as Savior, he removes the penalty of sin from us. But you probably noticed he has not removed the presence of sin, has he? And he has given us power over the power of sin. Sometimes we take it, sometimes we don't. But the power is there. When we get to heaven, we'll be relieved of the presence of sin, the power of sin, and the penalty. It'll be gone. The Bible not only gives us the origin of sin or evil, it shows it's temporary. It shows that God defeated sin on the cross. And it reminds us that that's the foundation, fundamental uh, message of the church, of Christians. But where do we find the documentation for where what is bad or wicked or sinful came from? The Bible said, incredible, the origin of evil. Also, the Bible deals with language. It is popular... And oh, we we eat this up. And again, I I love science, I love love studying animals. It's popular to equate the sounds of the animal world with the intelligent verbal communication of mankind. You know, dolphins talking to each other uh, and uh, whales talking to each other and other. And we talk about intelligent animals. They are only intelligent when compared to each other. When you compare them to human, there is no... The gap is unbridgeable. Genesis not only records the origin of language in general, the communication we have. It does that in Genesis when the Bible says that Adam and Eve communed or talked with God. They reasoned. Can you imagine talking, reasoning with God? God, how'd you do this? And God says, oh, well, let me tell you how. But God, they were communicating on a verbal level, very clearly. After they sinned, they hid themselves from God, but God communicated with them on a verbal level. Genesis not only records the origin of that language in general, but also the very language families and groups. And evolutionists have a real tough time with this. Biological science confirms all mankind came from a single couple, single pair. Our blood types, even our languages will show that. But how do you get a lot of languages from just one? If they're honest, the linguists say, well, we really don't know. We do. Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. Uh, I believe also that's the origin of language and races. I really do. You know, somebody years ago, um, uh, I, I have always had friends of all, uh, uh, every, I, we just grew up, just didn't care. And one of them said, aren't you proud of your race? And I said, no. They looked a little strange. I said, do you realize that races came from the, I believe it came from the Tower of Babel. And that's a reminder of man's first organized rebellion against God. God wants us to remind, to remind us of our rebellion, our rebellious nature. What God created to remind us of our universal equality as sinners in need of a Savior, Satan's done a pretty good job of dividing us, hasn't he? Hasn't he? Yeah. 
the origin of language. Only the Bible gives an answer of how they became so diverse. Um, India has several hundred language groups, and they're not like us. If you are, if, how many of y'all have a southern dialect of English? Come on, Jenny. Jim, you do when you sing. <laughs> Teresa? Okay. Now, how many of y'all have a New England accent, Bob? There you go. Here's, here's what we don't sometimes understand. Every dialect we have in America, you can pretty much understand what the other guys are saying, right? In India, you've got over 100 dialects, and they're like different languages. You cannot... Where did all that come from? Where did that diversity come from? God did it. And the Bible doesn't just assume that. It actually shows us when God... The Tower of Babel, He spread them over the world, I think, instantly. And that's where they were. Confounded their languages. Can you imagine? Instantly. You can't understand anybody else. Or maybe two or three of you can't. Only the Bible gives us the origin of languages. The Bible gives us the origin of government. The earliest reference to human government in the Bible is Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now, though it was written long after Hammurabi's law and some of the other ancient law codes, the time referencing is over 1,000 years before any of those codes existed. Genesis chapter 9, I believe verse 6, where God says this, uh, and whoever sheds man's blood by him, uh, whoever sheds man's blood, um, man will shed his blood. I'm, I'm getting the, the quote all messed up. I, well, why not read it? Okay. Here we go. Uh, and surely the blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it at the hand of man. At the hand of man, every blood's brother will I require. Verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Two things here. The first time anywhere in the Bible, first time we have any reference in humankind, where an individual human became responsible for the behavior of his culture. See what God is saying? If someone is a murderer, you're accountable for that, to judge it, to exercise judgment upon it. We now see a culture, a society that is being established, and there is a mutual responsibility to take care of it. And we're talking chronologically, certainly, early in the third or into the fourth millennium B.C., maybe even earlier. Humans so organized to what we understand in our culture we have a mutual responsibility to take care of it. Guys, that's not animalistic, that's human. And the Bible says it came from God. By the way, as God established government here, what was the first action that he specifically said was the responsibility of that culture? If someone commits murder, capital punishment, you take his life. Now, I say that with all the reverence that it demands. But a Christian cannot be consistent with the Bible and oppose capital punishment. Can't do it. And I say that with all kinds of love, but you can't do it. You can talk about, well, the mistakes that are made, and, and I get that, but do you think God knew it too? Remember, this was written after the flood. A lot of really bad stuff had happened and would happen, but God still said, this is what culture... If we are not governed by certain absolutes, culture falls apart. And we're experiencing that in this country. So here we have the origin of government, uh, Genesis 9, 6, where man becomes not only responsible for his own behavior, but for the behavior of all others in his culture, along with the punishment of evil acts, especially that of murder. How did that come about? Only the Bible gives us the source. The origin of civilization. Again, Dr. Morris made this observation. The Bible gives the basic elements of a civilized culture. 
urbanization, metallurgy, music, agriculture, farming, writing, education, navigation, textiles, and ceramics all have references in the book of Genesis. The origin of nations. This is a real problem with evolutionists. With the almost universal acceptance that man came from a single pair, how then can you explain the distinct nations and races if they all began the same language and the same race? I don't, I was, well, I was taught that. Guess what? There's no scientific evidence of it. No. I'll, I'll use me as an example. I'm a good example of a bad example. Okay. Um, you may not know this. I am third generation Floridian. Okay. When I was brought up, uh, I was taught that uh, your race was determined by your environment. Okay. Chinese had, had a yellow tinge because of what they ate. Okay. Indians, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, Indian, all that. Um, you know, uh, blacks, whites, we all, because of, I'm, like I said, I'm third generation Floridian. I still sunburn terribly. I don't tan. My grand, great grandparents came to Florida back almost 100 years ago. We were all agricultural, spent a lot of time outside. Where did the races come from? Well, biblically, God separated us out. He equipped us to be wherever he sent us. Racially, linguistically, we're there. But the diversity of languages for the Christian and diversity of races should remind us of the Tower of Babel. The first, man's first organized rebellion against God. But the origin of nations, the only workable answer we have is in the Bible. Science doesn't have one. One of my favorite origins is the origin of religion and their commonality. All religions have at least three common truths, at least three. The first is a belief in some form of truth that transcends man, that's superhuman, that's beyond the normal human experience. The second is that man is striving toward uh, identifying with or accomplishing a unity with that truth. And thirdly, every religion has or worships a God that's offended, that you've got to somehow please. That this is a universal character of mankind is un impossible to deny. The question is, where did it come from? There is no evolutionary theory that even addresses this. They treat it as if it does not exist. Genesis is clear, however, in recounting the origin of religion in general and the worship of the true God of the Bible in particular. Unique in Genesis. And finally, we may end up on time tonight. The origin of Israel. You cannot discuss origins in the Bible without discussing Israel. Um, Israel's very existence is unique and a contradiction to socio sociological anthropology. It is. They were without a country, without a home, for over 1,900 years, or almost 1,900 years. That means they were a people group that were scattered. Remember the dispersion the Bible talks about? Scattered all over the world. Every other time that has happened, that people group has been assimilated into the culture into which it was scattered. If Israel were normal and natural, in 1948, when we said, okay, we're going to establish the, the the land area of Israel, y'all come back, there would have been no one to come back. And sociology cannot explain it. This is unique. 
Uh, This is something that should never have happened, and yet it did. And Genesis not only gives us the origin of the country, or the, the, the family, the people, but explains why after 1900 years they still existed. You go back to Genesis 12, the first three verses. There was a contract that God made with Abraham. And in that contract, he said, by the way, this land is going to be yours forever. Forever. If that did not carry with it a promise to keep you forever, would that not have been academic? This land is going to be yours, but you're going to be destroyed. Just as the Bible has been the most hated book in the world, the most attacked book in the world, and yet it stands, Israel has been the most hated and attacked nation the world has ever seen, and yet it stands. You cannot explain that outside the Bible. It's impossible. Derek? Derek? Wow. Well, if you call that marker sin, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah you, you, you re- and that's, the, that's how far they go to try to explain it. You know, why, why should they be hated? Look at all the good. They have probably, as a people, more Nobel Prizes and more, PhD and all, more benefit they give in the world than any people group, and yet they are hated by the people they blessed. The only answer there is, is they have a supernatural protector. And that's where we'll end tonight. Fourteen origins that the book of Genesis gives us. And science is totally incapable of giving us an alternative for all of them, or for any of them. We have... As first, excuse me, second Peter says, a more sure word of prophecy. Why? It came from God Himself. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be timid. We may not have all the answers, and I do not. But we can get the answers, and I'm not afraid of them because every time we find real science, it supports the Bible. Remember what real science is observable and measurable. It goes beyond those two. It is no longer science. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to be in your word tonight. And Father, I pray that you would give us great confidence as we carry it forth. Father, your word indeed was not written to teach us science, but it is in every place scientifically accurate. And Father, we thank you for the evidence we have. Lord, the Bible's enough. It stands on its own. But when we can see evidence outside the Bible, how it strengthens our faith, it gives us that great confidence to exercise the faith we have. And Father, let us please be doing that in the world around us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.